Hello everybody and welcome back to Creation Myths. Today I am bringing you a creation trick and today's trick is quote mining the abstract of scientific papers. Before we get into the actual trick that creationists do here, we have to establish a baseline. What is an abstract in a scientific paper? When you're doing scientific writing, typically the papers that you generate, the research papers that go through the peer review process and get published in journals have a, a set structure, right? They always have the same part. So you have an abstract, you have an introduction, a method section where you describe what you did, the results, and the discussion, which is kind of your conclusion in the broader context. The abstract is the very first part. It's a usually one paragraph, sometimes a couple of paragraphs, but usually one paragraph summary of what the rest of the paper is going to be. And it contains a number of specific things. It does a couple of different jobs. So you always find some kind of setup in an abstract. The setup is what's the problem that's being addressed or what's the question that we don't have an answer to that the paper that you're reading right now is going to try to answer. And then after the setup, you're going to get brief summaries of the methods, right? What the authors of the paper did the results, what they directly found, and the broader conclusions. Again, this is all very brief. This is happening in the span of one paragraph. To illustrate how this structure works, I'm actually gonna show you the abstract of a paper I published way back in 2013. Now the actual like science going on here doesn't really matter for our purposes today. This was about viral codon bias. And like, if you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter, don't worry. The point is that I'm gonna use this paragraph to illustrate how abstracts work. So again, we're gonna start with a setup, and I do apologize, I'm gonna read this whole paragraph ultimately, but just, just go with it, it'll, it'll kind of contextualize what we're doing here. So we're gonna start with the setup, which I'm gonna highlight in red. It's gonna be color-coded as we go. So viral codon usage bias may be the product of a number of synergistic or antagonistic factors, including genomic nucleotide composition, translation, selection, genomic architecture, and mutational or repair biases. Most studies of viral codon bias evaluate only the relative importance of genomic base composition and translational selection, ignoring other possible factors. So that's the setup. Here are the things that could explain this thing. Most studies only consider a couple of factors and ignore the rest. So what did we do? What were our methods? We analyzed the codon preferences of single-stranded RNA viruses and single-stranded DNA viruses, plant viruses, that infect translationally distinct monocot and dicot hosts. That's what we did. Very brief overview. Next, results. What did we find? We found that neither genomic base composition nor translational selection satisfactorily explain their codon usage biases. Furthermore, we observed a strong correlation between the codon preferences of viruses in the same family or genus, regardless of host or genomic nucleotide content. So that's what we found. And then let's put a bow on it. Let's wrap it up. What's the conclusion? Our results suggest that analyzing codon bias as either due to base composition or translational selection is a false dichotomy that obscures the role of other factors. Constraints such as genomic architecture and secondary structure can and do influence codon usage in plant viruses and likely in viruses of other hosts. So this is the structure of an abstract. You set up a problem, you very briefly describe what you did to address that problem, the direct results, and then the broader conclusions. You do this all in a single paragraph right at the top of your paper. This tells the reader what they're going to read about if they decide to read your whole paper. So that's the setup. That's what an abstract is and what an abstract does. So what's the trick that creationists use? Well, what they do is they take the here's the problem line, right? Like in my paper here, most studies of viral codon bias evaluate only A and B, but they ignore all these other factors, right? That's the setup line. That's the here's the problem we're going to try to solve line, right? Creationists will take that line and they will present that as though it is the position held by or the argument being made by the authors of the paper, right? They just take that and say, look, these authors say that we don't look at anything beyond, in this example, base composition and translational selection. Evolutionists just ignore all these other factors. And look, these authors agree. That's how creationists would use this kind of thing. In order to do this, they have to ignore the rest of the abstract and the rest of the paper. 
because if you actually read the rest, that's where the authors are going to address the question or problem that they introduce in the first part of the abstract. So in order to make the claim that the authors actually hold the position that you could kind of make it look like based on that early part of the abstract, in order to make it look like they hold that position, you have to just pretend the rest of the paper, starting with the rest of the abstract, doesn't exist. It's an extremely dishonest trick to do because it takes the authors basically stating the problem they're going to solve, and it presents those authors as stating that the problem itself is an actual unsolved problem, right? And that's fundamentally dishonest. To illustrate this, I'm going to show you two specific examples that I've come upon of this specific thing recently. There are countless examples of this out there in the creationist literature. Go out and find your own. It's a fun game to play. Whenever you find a quote, see if uh, it seems like an abstract to you, and then go look up the paper and see if it actually is from an abstract. A lot of the times it is. But I'm only going to present two specific examples here. One is going to be from amateurs who may or may not know better, uh, but the second is going to be from professionals who 100% know better than to just lift that first line from the abstract. We'll start with our first example, which comes to us from Young Earth Creationist YouTuber Standing for Truth. He recently put out a book called The Endogenous Retrovirus Handbook, and one of my Patreon supporters bought this book for me, so I am reading it. And I will do a review of it once I finish it. Uh, I'm recording this right now in um, on May 17th of 2022. So once I finish the book, I'll have a, I'll do a review on YouTube. And thank you to the supporter who bought me the book. You know who you are for making me read this book. But anyway, so uh, on page 12 of this book, we get uh, an interesting claim. This book is all about endogenous retroviruses and how they don't actually support evolution. It doesn't matter for what we're talking about today. Uh, this is a small excerpt from page 12. We have a line right here where the author, SFT, uh, basically makes this argument. Say so they have acknowledged, they being evolutionists, have acknowledged that for most of these herb sequences, the infections would have occurred millions of years ago in the ancient and unobservable past. The argument that's being implied here is that herb integration into the genome is assumed because it's not observed. It happened in the past. We can't observe it happening in the present. Right? That's the argument that's being made here. And to do this, he has this quote right here. He says, endogenous, and this is from a paper, endogenous retroviruses are proviral sequences that result from the colonization of the host germline by exogenous retroviruses. The majority of herbs represent defective retroviral copies. However, for most herbs, endogenization occurred millions of years ago, obscuring the stages by which herbs become defective and the changes in both virus and host important to the process. Now, you can see just a little bit of pencil mark right there because I'm annotating this book as I go. And in the margin next to that, I wrote, bet that's the abstract. I went and looked up the paper and it turns out that is in fact the abstract. And it's better than that. This is the beginning of the abstract. This line right here, that's the setup line that I just described previously. This is the state the problem line in the abstract. What we're gonna do right now is put this line with the full abstract side by side, is this an accurate representation of the author's actual position? Nope. It turns out that the paper is actually about the exact opposite of the point that SFT is making here. Remember, he's arguing that IRV integration happened way in the past and it's not observable, so how can we know anyway if they actually come from viruses? Well, let's look at this abstract. This is the full abstract from the paper, which is linked below if you wanna see the full paper, really interesting paper. So we have the line right here that he quoted, however, for most IRVs, blah, 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 right? That's the line. But let's read the next line in the abstract right here. The koala retrovirus, KORV, only recently began invading the germline of the koala, permitting analysis of retroviral endogenization on a prospective basis. In other words, we have an example of this process happening in real time that we can observe in progress. That's what the literal next line is saying. It contradicts the claim he made 
right before using the first part of the abstract to support that claim. We can go further down because it's not just in this paper that they're saying, hey, we have an observed example of this that's happening right now in progress that we can study. You go to the end of the abstract and look at that. They actually propose some mechanisms, right, which suggests that recombination with existing degraded endogenous retro elements may be a means by which replication competent herbs that enter the germline are degraded. So the authors are not just saying, hey, this process is actually observable in the present. They're also proposing a mechanism through which viruses can become integrated as endogenous retroviruses, which is exactly the opposite of the point SFT wants to make and use this paper to support, right? It's actually doing the opposite. So that's one example of where you lift that first line from the abstract, even though the authors are actually making the opposite argument. Our second example comes from uh, the Dismantled documentary. This is a recent Young Earth documentary, Dismantling the Theory of Evolution. And this is the example where the guilty parties 100% know what they're doing. They know better than to think that that first line of an abstract is actually uh, representative of the argument the authors are making. So um, in this documentary, uh, we have some actual trained scientists involved, right? Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson, Dr. John Sanford, Dr. Rob Carter. These are young earth scientists with actual legit science credentials. Furthermore, this documentary was written by PhD candidate Christopher Roop, soon to be Dr. Christopher Roop. As somebody who's going through the process of earning a PhD, Christopher Roop knows the structure of scientific papers, 100% knows better than to think that that first line is something you can pluck out and present it as representative of the author's views. The thing they do in this dismantled documentary is claim mainstream support for their claims. Specifically, they make the argument that Michael Lynch, a prominent geneticist, Michael Lynch, and others agree in principle with the so-called waiting time problem. Now, I've talked about the waiting time problem at some length. Uh, I've got videos on it. I'll link it down below. Uh, but the, the short version of the waiting time problem is that to get a specific set of mutations together in a genome, it would take too long, longer than, you know, the time in evolutionary history that that genome or that organism could have evolved. So this is the, the waiting time problem. So um, the people behind this document documentary, they take this um, uh, Lynch and a bag 2010, it's the rate of establishment of complex adaptations, and they actually very helpfully highlight the first line of the abstract for us, right? That's that setup line that I've been talking about. So the setup line in this abstract is a central problem in evolutionary theory concerns the mechanisms by which adaptations requiring multiple mutations emerge in natural populations. That's actually a pretty concise summary of the waiting time problem. Yeah, how do we get adaptations that require multiple mutations? That probably takes a long time. How can we explain that? In this documentary, they pluck that line without further elaboration and say, look, geneticists agree with the waiting time problem, except there's a problem right here on this slide. This is a screen grab from a, a portion of this documentary that you can find on YouTube. Just search it dismantled on YouTube. I've also linked it down below. And this is what they show on screen. There's a problem here. The problem is that they show the full abstract. So you can read the rest of it if you pause the video. And if you read the rest of it, you can see that they actually show the conclusion down here that contradicts their claim of support. So at the end of the abstract, these authors write of their, their results taken together. These results illustrate the plausibility of the relatively rapid emergence of specific complex adaptations by conventional population genetic mechanisms. In other words, they are saying as the conclusion to their work here, right? The conclusion to this paper, the takeaway message is exactly the opposite of what is being claimed in this dismantled documentary. It's just 180 degrees. It's complete opposite. Again, these are not like random people spouting off on YouTube. These are professional scientists who have earned or are in the process of earning legitimate scientific credentials. They know better than to do this.
So in summary, creationists frequently quote mine the setup line from scientific abstracts, present that line in isolation as representative of the author's actual position, and ignore the rest of the abstract or paper where the authors address the problem that's raised in the setup line. Some creationists who do this may not know any better, but some definitely do. This has been the creation trick of quote mining the abstract, specifically the setup line from the abstract, and then pretending that's representative of the findings of the entire paper. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, comment, share. Thanks for watching, and don't get fooled.